All right, let's go ahead and begin the final talk for this evening, discipleship. And the theme of discipleship we're going to explore is the idea of taking up one's cross. So I'm going to read the end of chapter 8 just to get the image Jesus gives us clear in our mind, and then we'll explore it in some detail. If any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his life? For what can a man give in return for his life? Forever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation. Of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. So this is a, a very severe call. But it's a call with a promise. Whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. So it's severe, but with hope. And throughout this section, we have concrete examples of those who, in the encounter with Jesus, are invited to take up a cross and then respond either by taking it up or declining with certain outcomes or or results. So we're going to begin by studying the degree to which Peter and the other 12 uh, respond to this. They have some down moments, but they've got some up moments too. Let's again ponder their ministry, chapter 6, verses 7 to 13. This isn't made explicit in the text, but it's pretty implicit that they are actually being asked to take up some rather significant crosses here. The first and greatest of which is Jesus is sending them out of his presence to carry forward his ministry. See, up to this point, for the 12, it's just been a matter of, let's hang around in the general vicinity of Jesus and bask in his awesomeness. They no longer get to do that. They have to carry it out. They have to have faith that even outside of his presence, he will work what he intends to work. And as a sign of that faith, they are going with no backup. No wealth, no material goods to strengthen them in the mission, no food. They have to live off of what people are willing to give them, no second cloak. So they are taking up a cross of deprivation both spiritually and materially. And when they take up that cross, It bears fruit. They preach. People repent. They cast out demons. They anoint with oil. People are healed. In both of the miraculous feedings, they are asked to accept humiliation. That's fundamentally what's at stake between Jesus and the twelve when he tells them, five loaves, two fish, no problem. Go to it. And they distribute it. So 5,000 people, five loaves of bread. They had to go forward, accept the cross of humiliation, and then allow Jesus to work a miracle in response to that. I guess they were pretty slow since he needed to chide them again the second time he did it. You would have thought they would have had the idea at that point. So it goes. But we also see examples that when they impose their expectations on Jesus, they encounter failure. Now, to be fair, 
when the storm came, he did in fact calm the storm. In that sense, he answered their prayer. But it was at a cost, right? Why are you afraid? Have you no faith in response to their complaint? Do you care if we perish? In response to that challenge, they experienced a hardening of heart. Similarly, the rebuke of Peter represents his own unwillingness to take up a cross, which is why, in fact, immediately after Jesus castigates Peter for this, he then launches into the teaching on taking up your cross. Peter is unwilling to do that at this point. That's why all of this talk of he'll die and be raised in three days causes Peter to get so apoplectic so as to rebuke Jesus for saying it. Well, what does Peter get in reply? A bit of a smackdown. Let's look next at Jairus of the synagogue and his daughter. So this is 521 to 43. So this was right after the curing of the demoniac. They crossed the lake back to the other side. Uh, and Jairus says, My daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be weighed well and live. So initially, this actually doesn't really go very well, right? He's a father. His daughter is dying. He's suffering horribly from this. Then there's, it takes a while to get there. There's the intermission uh, with the woman with the hemorrhage. We're going to talk more about her in a moment. But when they're finished with that, they say, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But ignoring what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. So at this moment, Jairus is being asked by Jesus to take up a cross of humiliation. The people around him are not supporting what he's doing. They're like, just forget about it. Your daughter's dead. It's over. Give up. Jesus invites him to persist in spite of the fact that he is now the target of mockery. And he persists. He follows through on that. He accepts that cross. But he's not the only one. And when he, Jesus had entered, he said to them, Why do you make a tumult and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Jesus himself is now getting mocked in the moment. But because Jairus joins Jesus in taking up his cross, accepting humiliation, in response, there is a miracle, a resurrection. He told, her to give, told them to give her something to eat. Now let's look back on a moment to the woman with the hemorrhage. She too had suffered horribly. A woman who had had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had but was no better but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment for she said, if I touch even his garments, I shall be made well. And immediately the hemorrhage ceased and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. It's not a lot of text, but there was an awful lot of suffering behind that text. Think for a moment about the great faith of this woman. Twelve years of suffering, and at a very deep level, she did not give up on God. 
when we have to take up a cross, part of the cross itself is not necessarily knowing how long it's going to last or when it's going to end or what we might be called to endure. But that woman endured tremendous suffering. She lost all her money. Who knows what a first century physician was doing. I don't even want to think about it. And in all of that, she preserved a kernel of faith thinking this man who has come and is working miracles will do one for me. God will heal me through him if only I touch his cloak, if only I put myself in his very presence. She accepted that cross, but in a way it got worse. Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone forth from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And in sort of a funny moment, the disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? It's as if they interpreted him as being like, Hey, you twelve, figure out who touched me. And they're like, What? Whatever, man. But the woman knowing what had been done to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. She accepted the cross of coming forward. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. So what she gets from this is not only the physical healing, but the knowledge that she is being addressed as if she were part of the family of Jesus Christ. In her loneliness, she is now adopted into the greater family of the kingdom of God. And that, too, is a blessing bequeathed upon her after she accepted her cross. I personally wonder, in pondering this passage and how the interaction between Jesus and Jairus frames the healing of this woman, that if perhaps in some deep way her acceptance of her cross was, even unknowingly for her, part of and contributed to Jairus's intercession on behalf of her daughter. I don't know that for sure, but it's something I ponder you know, as I think about and reflect on the passage and, and I think about how in our Catholic faith we're always encouraged to pray for each other and offer things up for each other knowing that Jesus in his ineffable wisdom will make use of it in the manner that he most sees fit. Let's go back to the demoniac for a moment. As you all know, obviously I love this guy. Um, he takes up his cross. He wanted to follow Jesus immediately. And at this point, who can blame him? Think about this. He was healed. The horror movie is over. And what do the locals say? Well, I don't care that he's healed. The pigs died. Get out of here. He is facing not only the profound rejection and alienation from his people that came in accompaniment to his possession, but even after being healed of that possession, he is still being rejected by his own people. So at that point, why would he stick around? There's nothing for him there. He wants to follow Jesus. And Jesus says... No, don't come with me. Proclaim what has been done for you to these people. I'm reminded of the story of St. Patrick, right? So the story of St. Patrick, right, is that he was kidnapped when he was 16 years old by Irish pirates, sold into slavery, was a slave for 10 years until he escaped from these horrid Irish pirates. 
He escaped, became very close to God, became a bishop. And then what happens? He's sent back to the wretched Irish. Right? The Irish people who had kidnapped him, oppressed him, humiliated him, and mistreated him, he was now being told to preach the gospel to them. It worked out okay. Right? And there's a parallel here with what's happening with the Gerasene demoniac. Jesus sends him to people that he has every reason to believe are going to reject him further. But he accepts that cross, and in accepting it, amazing things happen. Same goes with the Syrophoenician woman. Jesus challenges her. She answers the challenge, and either directly or indirectly through her accepting of that cross, of that challenge, accepting that humiliation, her prayer bears more fruit than she could possibly have imagined. So now I need to comment a little bit about some people that weren't terribly willing to accept what Jesus was telling them, and that was the people of Nazareth. This is a pretty sad passage at the start of chapter 6. Um, where did he get all this? Why is he doing this? Isn't this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country and among his own kin and in his own house. And he couldn't do miracles there because they weren't open to receiving them. It's parallel to how Jesus only shows up when he's invited, right? I want to make a side comment here about the nature of the brothers and sisters. These are not children of Mary in the teaching of the Catholic Church. In the Aramaic language, the terms brother and sister can refer to a rel any relative in the given generation, so cousins, for example, and so forth. That doesn't really apply in Greek. Greek has very specific terms for cousins and the like. But Mark, not a native speaker of Greek, is very much using um, Semitic usage, Aramaic usage here, in thinking about them. So uh, James and Joseph, for example, later on in chapter 15, verse 40, turn out to be sons of a different Mary, who's presumably a collateral relative either of Mary or Joseph, for example. I wanted to highlight that here because of the importance of the doctrine of the perpetual virginity of Mary and how this passage can often be interpreted in a way that undermines it. But that's not necessarily the case. And I want to highlight here that this situation doesn't even apply necessarily to all of Jesus' family. The brother James the Less uh, in the Catholic tradition is counted actually as one of the apostles, the James who's not the son of Zebedee, in fact. And he wound up being an important figure in the uh, Jerusalem church um, until his martyrdom in 62 AD. So to sum up, what we learn about discipleship in this section. Why take up the cross? In general, if somebody suggests that you take up an instrument of execution, we would rightly look upon that as a bad idea. But Jesus intercedes for us when we accept and take up our particular crosses. And something we need to keep in mind about this is that in many ways, some of the crosses we're called to take up are crosses that we need to take up in combat of our own sins. Let me give you an example from early in my career of something I experienced along these lines. I was teaching a course in which teamwork, group work were very, very important. And I had a student 
whose attendance was simply terrible, and he was kind of leaving his team high and dry. And as this pattern of poor attendance continued, I personally got angrier and angrier about it until he finally actually did come to class one day, and I criticized him pretty harshly in front of the entire class for his truancy, for his lack of attendance and participation. He meekly uh, accepted it and went about his work. After class that day, one student remained behind, not the student I had criticized, but another student. The student who remained behind said that he needed to tell me something with a lot of respect, and I said, okay. He said, yeah, I'm the, R I'm the RA for that kid, and I just thought you should know that his uh, father is seriously ill, and he's been having to travel a lot and miss a lot of class because of his father's illness, which also has him very stressed out. And I understand that you need to run your class the way you, that makes sense, um, but I just thought that, you know, you should know that. So I thanked him for his words and uh, sent him on his way. And at that point, of course, I felt deeply, deeply convicted. Why? Because I'm in a position of authority. I'm a professor. These students, they're adults, I guess, right? But still just kids, really. And it was entirely out of place for me to treat him so harshly as a means of channeling my own frustrations with him. At a bare minimum, I should have talked with him privately, but that kind of humiliation he did not deserve. And my willingness to rush to judgment, to assume laziness or irresponsibility when the underlying truth was something completely different, I felt deeply convicted in my soul. I, of course, went to confession, and at a later time when I saw the student again, I delivered him a most sincere apology. Right? What happened? I wasn't willing, right, to take up my cross of frustration, which in that moment, for me, in that time, in that moment, was a cross for me to take up. I needed to accept the frustration and move on and deal with it. And in that moment, I was weak and refused. I mean, I like to say that I was weak, but truly, in my own frustration, I succumbed to sin. Nobody compelled me to do that. I chose it. And so part of what I learned from that was to have a bit more readiness to accept the inevitable crosses that come with dealing with people who could do things to frustrate me or what have you, especially when I don't know the whole story. And truly, we almost never do. That's why judgment is reserved to God alone, not for us. I'm not saying don't make, you know, judgments that are on a practical level. Um, Sometimes there are people that do need to be avoided or what have you. But the state of the soul, their moral worthiness, not our call. Not my call. And that was a cross I had to learn to accept. I don't have any miracle of intercession to give as a consequence of this. But really the blessing I got was my own awareness of my own sinfulness and my deep need to do something about it to change my ways. And so, when we're willing to accept crosses, Jesus observes this, and he can bless us in recognition of that. And that can be an encouragement, but often the outcomes are veiled and not given to us. So we remember here the parable of the mustard seed tiny seed out of view. It doesn't bear fruit until a much later time. We may have to accept a cross, the fruit of which is not something we're even necessarily given the blessing of seeing. We just have to trust that Jesus will make use of that cross in a way that will be for the good of the kingdom. Jairus Perhaps with the woman of the hemorrhage, Jesus granted the gift of defeating death. 
the Syrophoenician woman, the Gerasene, brought salvation to the Gentiles. As we see, Jesus rebukes those who refuse their crosses. Herod falls deeper into sin. The Pharisees demanded a sign. Why didn't they get a sign? Because they wouldn't accept their cross. What was their cross? To get down from their high horse and pay attention to what God was already working in their midst. Ultimately, in taking up our crosses, we imitate and follow Jesus. Through accepting his own cross, he interceded for all of us for the sake of our salvation with his death. The minor crosses and even major crosses we encounter, we can join with that of Jesus Christ. As we'll explore over the next two weeks, this marks a turning point in the gospel. Jesus has traveled. He has undertaken his mission. Now he begins moving towards Jerusalem. As he calls people to take up their cross and follow him, he prepares on the journey to Jerusalem to accept his own cross. And it is to that journey that we will dedicate the next two Wednesday nights. Thank you all for coming tonight. I've got some reflection questions for you to ponder on your own. Well, let's close with a prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, I give thanks for the opportunity to journey through the Gospel of Mark with all of the people that you have assembled here this evening. I ask you to pray for both myself and for all of us here assembled to prayerfully discern what crosses Jesus is calling us to take up and for us to prayerfully accept those knowing that Jesus will turn it into a great bounty. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Look forward to seeing everybody next week as we look at chapters 9 through 12. Have a great week, everyone.